you want to, without further ado, make space for this. So thank, thank you so you. much, Bishop, for being here. May I say a quick word of prayer as we begin? God, we are grateful for this life that you've entrusted to us, and we are grateful for wise voices that help us learn to heed your call to be good stewards of that gift. Thank you for Bishop Swing and his ministry among us for so many decades and for the clarity of his voice with us in worship. Uh, as we engage in this conversation, give us courage and compassion and clarity about the work you call us to now in the days ahead. All this we ask in Jesus and in the power of his spirit. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Well, thank you for being here. Great to be back. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, let me start off by saying a little bit about the evolution of writing the book. Uh, it's not a very big book. <clears throat> Only one picture in it, though. <laughs> um, I didn't intend to write this book. I, I intended to write something on the Gospel of St. Mark. I spent two years working on background for Mark. And then uh, I started, I've been working deeply in nuclear weapons for many years, so then I thought, why don't I take what Mark is saying 2,000 years ago, where we are with nuclear weapons, and let me put them together. And then, uh, I shared what I had written with a guy in Canada, and he said, there's, there's another dimension you ought to think about putting in there. So I decided that I would put the George Schultz, former Secretary of State, dimension into it. Uh, about 1998 or something like that, George, we were very close friends. I was, I was really honored to be his friend. And he said, I'm having all these experts in nuclear weapons uh, at Stanford for two, two days, and I'd like you to come down and listen. So here were the generals and admirals in the Washington Post and the New York Times and the scientists, and, and, and I was upstairs just taking notes in the balcony. And after two intense days of everybody, all the experts talking, just before we left, George looked up in the uh, balcony and he said, and Bill, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> think? I was just, put, I was just writing, I need to know this, I need to know. So, um, so I decided that I would make this book uh, an answer to George. And uh, every chapter is Dear George. This is what I, this is, this is what I think. I know you did, I'm going to tell you anyway. So, uh, one of the, there's so many things I can say about George, but um, one thing I want to make sure you hear, and that is uh, back in the Cold War when the proliferation of the we weapons went from 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 70,000 warheads, and they were going like crazy. And uh, Gorbachev, a uh, farm boy from um, Russia, and Reagan, a farm boy from uh, America, went off to Reykjavik, and George Schultz went uh, as George's assistant, uh, Reagan's assistant. And they were sitting there one day in Reykjavik. This is the most amazing story. These two farm boys, uh, Gorbachev and Reagan, looked at each other and said, this is madness. We're going to, we're going to blow up the plant. Um, let's get, we got 70,000 warheads. Let's get down to 60. Well, let's get down to 50. Well, let's get down to 40. Well, let's get down to 30. And one of them said, let's get rid of all of them. It's the last moment that the earth had a chance. Get rid of all these. In a, in a sentence, uh, in Reykjavik with uh, George, Ronald Reagan, and Mikhail Gorbachev. And they, Gorbachev said, I can't sell this back home. And George, and then uh, Gorbachev said to Reagan, You got to get rid of your Star Wars. And 
So he said, I'm not getting rid of that. And he said, well, I can't get rid of it. So, so they stopped. And, um, so what they did do, which was wonderful, and they said, we gotta, we got to make this uh, happen. So there were a lot of procedures, a lot of meetings, and the warheads are down to 13,000 now from 70. So people say we haven't made any progress. We've, had, we've made great progress. Uh, the problem is, in the old days, it was two countries. Now it's nine countries. And then you got more and more people with their fingers on the button. And then you got more proliferation now, not in terms of number of warheads necessarily, but in terms of the strength of the bombs. The Hiroshima bomb is, is very small compared to what we're capable of today. So, so there you go. Um, let me talk a little bit about The Earth, uh, you think, well, the Earth's always been here and it always will be here, and that's not. There was a time it wasn't here, and there'll be a time that there's no life on it. Uh, there'll be a time when, uh, perhaps because of heat, uh, it'll be an uninhabitable planet. Two summers ago, very interesting. Uh, some young assistant astronomer was looking through the lens and saw a planet being eaten by a star. There was a star here and a planet here and the planet got off of its course and it came into the gravitational pull of the star and the, and the star was running out of gas. And the planet had a lot of gas. And the planet ate it. I mean, the star ate the planet. Gone. In a, <laughs> in a flash. Uh, that, that could happen with, um, that could happen with uh, Mars, it could happen with Jupiter, and maybe it could happen with, uh, with Earth. Um, somebody else wrote a book about uh, extinctions. And it's very interesting about extinctions. It, the author said there have been five extinctions where everything that existed didn't exist anymore. And the, uh, the dinosaurs were like the fourth extinction. Uh, they were here and then they're not there. And interestingly enough that um, uh, every time there's an extinction, the Earth gets stronger. You say, well, what if you lose all the life on the planet? Well, you, can, you get rid of a lot of the life on the planet, but what takes its place and what comes up is stronger than what used to be there. Um, this is off to the side, but I'll never forget <clears throat> moving to California and, and living through my first earthquake. <laughs> I mean, it was really a big one in 1989 at Loma Prieta. And the big... I got so angry because I always thought Terra was firma. <laughs> and once it dawns on you, Terra is not firma. And then you find out underneath there are all kinds of stuff going on, red hot stuff that's going there 24 hours a day, and then you think, oh man. <laughs> Am I disappointed? <laughs> um, but that's the same thing I felt, that, you know, when I begin to, to look at all this. And one of the thoughts was, um, one, of the, one of the big experts in AI, AI said that the time might come where the uh, robots think that humans are scum <laughs> and get rid of the humans. Um, I mean, that's just a fictional kind of a thought, but the guy talked about it. And I, I wrote down here that something looks like refugees or refrigerator, but I can't refer to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're, you're, 
going to miss that point. <laughs> Unless I make a big comeback here. <laughs> um, one of the things that got me in my research, and, and that is um, looking into the James Webb Space uh, Telescope. And, um, and then you, you really, it really turns on you how infinitely small we are. I mean, all of our thinking is we're it. We're the center of the universe. And it's not, we're not the center of the universe. There are 11 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. There are 11 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way. We're just one, one little planet that someday is going to be out of business. Um, one way or another. So, so once you get it in your mind that we're not permanent, nothing's permanent, um, then it begins to look different. Um, one of the things that, that happened to me, uh, and I haven't written about this, but um, when you look at the liturgy of the Episcopal Church or any church, uh, how much of it is predicated on the end? We celebrate the end. We can't wait for the end. We can't wait for the second coming of Jesus. Jesus said, look, you, you got to plant a seed in the ground and let it die, and then it comes to life. That's the whole, that's almost the whole story. Uh, we, um, let's just take the Lord's Prayer. Um, On earth as it is in heaven. We're not praying that uh, we get out of this, this place and go to the good place. <laughs> that is not what we're talking about. The Lord's Prayer is talking about that place coming down to this place. On earth as it is in heaven. That means a radical uh, change of value, a radical change of, uh, of everything. <laughs> but on earth, uh, not in space. Um, there are five classic doctrines uh, in Christian theology. The first doctrine is the doctrine of creation. Second doctrine is the doctrine of the fall. We all sin and come short of the glory of God and, and face the consequences. Um, the third one is redemption. Uh, the fourth one is the realm of the spirit. Uh, once you're redeemed, there is a new way of looking at, um, at yourself in life. And the fourth one is the end, and we believe in the end. Uh, what do we believe in the end of? We believe in the end of us. We believe in the end of um, everything. Uh, that it will, it's, it's not a matter of, um, uh, it, it's, it's all going to come home wonderfully. It's a matter of everything has to be changed, uh, transformed in the end. And Jesus was very clear about the end. He, I mean, he, he wasn't, he, he had no illusion that this is going to be a happy time. Uh, when you read his words, it's, uh, you know, you wish you weren't born uh, when the end comes. But there's, um, that's, that's the seed dying, but then the, the new growth. So um, I'll stop here and uh, 
And Deb, you can give me some questions, and I'm going to figure out whether the refrigerator is part of it. Oh, correct. <laughs> I figured it out. <laughs> yeah. When I was when I was trying to write this book, I was looking around uh, at at what religions uh, say about nuclear weapons. And all of them, boy, up at the top, they have great statements after great statements after great statements. And then you go down to the grassroots where all of us are in the pews, and nobody wants to hear anything about that. Uh, I think I preached about that today. Um, I, I gave a talk on, uh, on all of this to about 350 people who are very active in their communities, Muslim, Jews, Christians. And I said, uh, okay, in your synagogue, in your, in your mosque, in your church, in the last 10 years, how many of you have heard one sermon on nuclear weapons? Nobody. Nobody held their hand. And I said, okay, how many people have in your mosque, in the center, have... Uh, Education material to teach people what really is going on in nuclear weapons. I said, please hand, hold up your hand if you've ever seen your religion have any kind of material to help people get their brain around what's going on with nuclear weapons. Nobody. Nobody. Uh, we're in this kind of stasis thing where we're very happy to have the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Pope give great statements against nuclear weapons, and then please don't talk about it. Um, it's a very, it's a, yeah, that's what I was talking about. The, it gets, and it gets worse. Uh, Putin has the uh, chief arch, uh, metro, metropolitan, Kirill is his name. He blesses, he blesses the nuclear weapons. They, and they say, and he says, it's very, it's, I won't get this right exactly, but the point is he's saying also, uh, Russia has to save the world, and if we have to, we have to blow it up, so be it. Uh, we, we need these weapons to bring the, the world into. And then in, in uh, Great Britain, they have uh, services to bless the, uh, tried to sailors who have nuclear weapons because they kept uh, England safe. Um, you, and then it, it goes on and on and on about religions. Um, I, I think I'll I think I'll quit there and Bev, you can ask me some questions now. Any okay. questions? Okay. Good. Well, as it said in our presentation hymn, come and seek the ways of wisdom. I think we have some wisdom right here. <laughs> and I want to give our thanks to George Schultz for asking you, what do you think? <laughs> and now I have some questions, kind of off the wall, sidebar questions before we get into imminent death. Um, I'm, what do you think? Um, first of all, do you want to sit down? Nope. No. <laughs> my brains are in my feet. I can, I can keep them stimulated. I'm okay. I, my brains are not in the other area. <laughs> okay, well, then maybe I should stand up. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, what about my favorite? questions is from the New York Times book review and they always ask authors who would you like to have dinner with if you you're planning a dinner mm. party you can invite three people living or dead not George mm. or somebody else mm. uh, to come and have spend an evening with you what three people would you pick? Well, I'd, I'd pick Thomas Jefferson right off <laughs> I'd, I'd take St. Paul right off it, it, interesting character um, I'd like to see him, and um, um, maybe Ben Hogan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> okay, then uh, going a, a little bit deeper, uh, the scientists have talked, there's so many articles and books and speeches and stuff now about how spirituality is planted within our brains, you know, it's part of our system here, and there's always a discussion about religion, spirituality. I would like your view on what is spirituality. <laughs> well, um, I, I just think, uh, my father is not, my father only went to church one time in my life, and I, I preached a sermon and celebrated the sacrament in Parkersburg, West Virginia. And my father, who probably, he probably he never went to junior high school, he was a professional athlete, and uh, he uh, he came out, and when the church service was over, he was the first one out the door, man. <laughs> and he said, he said, you really told those son of the bitches a thing or two. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's a, that's a blessing. <laughs> my father blessed me. <laughs> but my father uh, said one time, he said, you know, I was down on the railroad track, and a, a boy and I were playing, and a train hit the boy, and the boy died. And he said, uh, a couple years later, or sometime later, he said, I was down at the railroad track, and I saw the boy. The boy was there. And for my father, that was uh, the closest to spirituality. I mean, that was spirituality for him. Something bigger than himself was going on here, and he was part of it for a second. And I think, you know, I think everybody's part of it uh, with um, with nature, with uh, music, uh, with friendship, with uh, all. I mean, spirituality is just uh, uh, that dimension of life that that should, that uh, guarantees you that there's more going on than you can imagine. Uh, there are other dimensions, and uh, any, whatever lifts, lifts you out of where you are and tells you you're not alone in the universe, that you're part of uh, uh, some complex that, that can't just be put in numbers and figures. Um, I think that would be spirituality. Okay. Yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Are you a school teacher? Or... <laughs> <laughs> you get an A one. Oh. <laughs> Extra credit. Extra okay. credit. <laughs> okay. How about this one? President Jimmy Carter is quoted as saying, "Just one person can change the world." Do you agree with that? <clears throat> oh, absolutely. I mean, how many one persons have changed the world? Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, and, that, and we're talking, you know, conspicuously, but I think um, inconspicuously, everybody changes the world by doing what you do, uh, even if it's dumb. Uh, yeah, the world needs uh, life needs everything, uh, all the species and all the parts of the species and. Uh, even if, even if you, uh, whatever you do, eating breakfast or turning on the tube or walking down the street, I think every, everybody plays a little part for a couple of years on the planet Earth. Uh, sure, I think everybody changes it. You get a little bit of difference and, and it all changes. Yeah. I'd have to sit and think about that. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, how about this one? Go. Do you have a Bible verse or a motto that you turn to when things are wobbly? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my favorite Bible passage is, uh, Behold, I make all things new. He who sits on the throne says, Behold, I make all things new. And I think, okay, if that's, what, if that's God's job and God is at it, terrific. There's a new something coming up. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for it. Okay, okay. Um, and lastly, 
you've lived all over, I don't know that you've lived all over the world, but you've traveled all over the world, and you've been to lots of different places, and you yep. live different places. Yep. How come we're lucky enough to get you back in Berlin? <laughs> <laughs> and at St. Paul's. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, uh, I wrote a book about uh, how Mary and I uh, traveled the world to uh, start the United Religions Initiative. And we were with the Pope, and we were with the Ecumenical Patriarch, and we were with Mother Teresa, and we were with the uh, Sheikh of al Azhar and the uh, Grand Mufti, and the Chief Rabbi, and the blah, 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 blah. And everybody who reads the book, I'm always sucking around for a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> so, did you read the book? <laughs> really? What do you, what'd you think? You know, and they, they never give me a compliment. They always say the same thing. They say, Mary is a saint. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. And that's true. So do we have cards? Is that yes. Uh, why, you, why did you come here? If oh, why did we come here? Yeah. I came here, Mary and I came here because... Uh, two things. Uh, number one, having lived through the earthquake of 89, I don't like bridges anymore. <laughs> and I, I want to live on a peninsula. I don't want to go home on a bridge. <laughs> and secondly, I wanted, I, I'm a golfer and I have a bunch of buddies who play golf and I want to be near my buddies to play golf. That's Good yeah. enough. Good enough. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Now on to Emma. Any other cards? Okay. These look like refrigerator cards. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Various faiths, including Christianity, talk about great calamity of fire, water, darkness, etc. within their scriptures. If there are many ways our face are the same. <laughs> or similar, same. similar. Don't, Refrigerator, don't. I never know. <laughs> <laughs> Something about our personal demise. Why aren't there more people listening? Personal demise. Yeah, why aren't there more people listening? Yeah, I don't. Um, well, you all know the answer as well as I do. I mean, we're all trying to figure it out. Um, if, if we're all doing something that is um, kind of committing suicide in slow motion, why don't we stop? Why, don't we, why doesn't somebody say something? Why don't we do something? And, um, you know, I... Um, we do that with the environment, we do that with the weapons, but the weapons end up being environment anyway. You know, you can say nuclear weapons, but it's really environment. Um, but when, in, in my little studies, and in, in, I find an awful lot of people around the world working hard on um, uh, getting rid of nuclear weapons, dealing with nuclear, nuclear weapons, you know, you look at physicians and you, for the, you look at nurses, you look at teachers, you look at all kinds of people around the world are working every day uh, on this subject. Uh, legislators are doing that. The senator in uh, Massachusetts, Markey, and uh, lots of other senators are working on it every day. It's not a, it's not a matter of nobody's doing nothing. Um, it's just that the people who, um, who have the money and the people who have the politics, um, well, in the book, I was saying, uh, they gave uh, Barack Obama a Nobel Peace Prize because he said we're going to stop nuclear pro proliferation and we're going to disarm, et cetera, et cetera. And after he was in office a little bit, he said, uh, but not in my lifetime. <laughs> Whoa, not in my lifetime. Um, a lady from, uh, Nikki Haley from South, you know, she, she said, uh, nothing I want more for my children than 
to rid the world of nuclear weapons, but um, we have to be realistic. That's the word. We have to be realistic. Uh, so it's kind of like the unrealism versus realism. Um, and uh, you know, there, we have nine countries that have nuclear weapons now, but South Korea will have them um, someday, and Saudi Arabia will have them someday. And so now we have nine, yeah, 11, and then how, how many countries are gonna have, how many weapons and how powerful are gonna be the weapons? Um, so I don't even know what the question was, but. <laughs> <laughs> Refrigerator. But I'm, that's, that's what I think. <laughs> okay, what do you think about this one? Please say something about fear and the role it plays in arms of all kinds. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, that's when you boil it all down, um, it comes down to uh, if, if we don't have bigger weapons than they do, then we fear that they're going to get us. Well, then that game goes on forever. And then they say, the same thing, and then we say the same thing, and they say the same thing, and we say the same thing. So we've been at it now for 78 years, 79 years of that fear. So I raise you one, I raise you one, I raise you one. Uh, in, in the old days, it was the United States and Russia had the weapons, that was it. And it, it's true that uh, today China is, uh, increasing and especially in terms of submarines you have nuclear weapons uh, uh, in silos that go up in the silos and then you got uh, nuclear weapons in submarines and then you got nuclear weapons in bombers so um, uh, more bombers more silos more Submarines, uh, and China is getting much better on submarines, but they're nothing like we have. We, we're, we're way advanced from them. But then the fear is, well, what if? And fear just, there's no end to the fear. There's no end to the fear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you going to ask a question about hope or not? <laughs> <laughs> well, these aren't mine. That's oh, 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 okay, okay. Oh. Okay, with uh, with all the influential world leaders you have shared a table with, do you feel there are any ideas to eliminate nuclear weapons that are possible today in the world's environment? Yeah. Um, You know, there are Mikhail Gorbachevs out there, and there are Ronald Reagans, and there are George Shultzes, and there are Obamas, and there are Nikki Haley's, and there are there are people out there, um, and there are ambassadors who are working on this every day, um, and there are staffs of these people. Um, I, you were you were saying. Are there people out there? Sure, there are, there, there are a lot of intelligent, hardworking uh, people. I think one of the things we've got to do is, is, take, is to mobilize the voice of ordinary people. Uh, we did have a freeze movement in the United States back in the 80s, and we got the whole country together, and we, we made an impact. But since then, we've just said, well, let the government, the, you know, nothing bad's happened. So how do you get rid of nuclear weapons? Uh, uh, one way is uh, just let them all land and explode, and then we won't have any nuclear weapons anymore, or any life or any, anything. Um, another way is that we can keep de-escalating. We can get them from 70,000 to 13,000, to get it down to 10,000, to get it down to how many... How many nuclear weapons does a country need to have to protect its security? 
That's a big question. You don't need everything, everything, everything. Uh, oh man, I'm in, into it now. Um, uh, what I'd like to do, in case you never ask the question, I'd like to get to hope. <laughs> because um, um, everything that I've said up to now has been based on answering the question, are human beings basically good or are they basically bad? And it depends on what we do with nuclear weapons. I think if we, if the nuclear weapons uh, have their day, then we're basically bad. If we can figure out how to, how to moderate, reduce, eliminate, then I think people are basically good. I don't think you can have it both ways. Um, but if you look at our hymns and you look at our liturgy and you look at our music that we sing in church, it's all about uh, the coming of the kingdom. It's about the end. Uh, it's about hope. You know, what, what was Jesus? What was Jesus's hope? Uh, he wasn't hoping that the United States of America would survive forever. Uh, it was a much bigger, deeper, uh, more poignant hope than any nationality or religion or race or anything like that. It was about a whole, he kept saying, you know, he kept using the word kingdom, but that was the word you'd use in those days. But it's a realm uh, where you only, uh, maybe in uh, the realm we're living in, maybe we only pick up a couple of clues uh, Jesus kept saying, well, the kingdom of heaven is like, using a simile after a simile after a simile, it's like, uh, and uh, they said, well, will you get married in heaven? I said, well, no, you're not given, they don't marry in heaven. It's a, it's a whole different ball game game. Uh, there, there, are other, there are other dimensions that you all, I, you, you don't even, you don't know, but there's a kingdom or there's a realm that will be revealed. And uh, human beings will be uh, transformed. Uh, who, how, all those questions, I don't know. But his message was uh, there will be an end to everything. And there will be Behold, I make all things new. Uh, I make planets new. Uh, I make uh, people new. Uh, make everything new. And so, yeah, that that would be that would be um, our church's hope. And so that would be my hope too. Okay. I try to find some hopeful ones here, <laughs> and, and, and some I can read. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, this one even has a title, yep. uh, Seeds of Our Witness. You wrote that Jesus was a seed God, sowed through death and resurrection to bring about new, unimaginable dimensions of life for the world. What might God want to sow through our witness to the divine is a long one. Caring, mercy, and sacrifice that bears fruit for greater possibility here and now in our time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> I believe in all of that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to be uh, silly about it. That's, can I just hold that for a while? Here's one from uh, a golfing buddy of mine who's sitting out there. He says, uh, what, is, what, what is it going to take to achieve a nuclear-free world? And um, uh, I, th I think what it's going to take is um, um, groundswell. And I hate to say it, but uh, that might, the, the groundswell might come because uh, of a nuclear accident. Uh, 
Um, we've had a lot of nuclear accidents. Uh, nuclear weapons have fallen out of airplanes and landed in trees in North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, we've had, uh, in Russia, they ran a simulation of, uh, uh, they put in a tape, they didn't know it was a tape, they put it in and it said, America has launched. And so they, they got ready to launch and they, they were, they had their fingers on the button and some colonel came in there and said, I don't believe it. And he saved the world. Um, there, we've been saved so many times by crazy things uh, and nuclear weapons. And, uh, and But if, if there's an accidental one or there's a rogue one in New York Harbor or if there's on and on and on and on and people see the damage that one weapon could do. Uh, we saw that in Hiroshima, but with the weapons we have now, Hiroshima would be small compared to what, what we are capable of now. If, if there were um, a, if there were a contained nuclear strike or two, uh, and the world woke up. Uh, and it's not going to change unless the consensus of the world changes. Uh, as I was saying today, it, it, it's so quiet you don't know what the consensus is. And people are so not wanting to talk about it or think about it. But um, if there is a tactical nuclear uh, weapon released in Ukraine by Belarus, I, what's his name, something, Chinko, no, I, I'll never get that name up. Um, if, if, he, if he sets off a tactical nuclear weapon and uh, somebody responds with a tactical nucle nuclear weapon in Belarus uh, or in Western Europe or in NATO, uh, then off we go. And... Uh, if, if we have time. The, the issue is, is there going to be time? Uh, it takes about 30 minutes uh, for the nuclear war to start, and it takes uh, a very short time, uh, a matter of hours before it ends. Uh, so it's, but is there a, a, a briefer period of time where something happens where everybody wakes up and says, wait a minute, we've got to stop. At this point, the military industrial complex is so dug in, um, the nations are so dug in and uh, saying the same thing, they're going to get us, they're going to get them, they're going to get us. That, um, <clears throat> so what it was going to take, um, that, that's what I think. <laughs> We're running short here. Okay. This is the next steps. You offer specific guidance on pages 106 to 107 about actions we can take based on our personal spheres of influence to work on this crucial issue. What can a community like St. Paul's uniquely, what can we do as we come together to pray, reflect, and take action as we grapple with these moral matters? Good. What can we do? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, I work with somebody from St. Paul. I work with Joan Cleary. Uh, we have a group called Voices for a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. And that was started by um, George Schultz and Secretary of uh, Defense Bill Perry and Ambassador Thomas Graham and Ambassador James Goodby and the physicist Sidney Drell and Mikhail Gorbachev uh, joined us at the end of his life. And uh, we keep it going, and we have, uh, if you want to look us up, uh, it's uh, voices slash uri.org, and um, you can begin to educate yourself. These are the movies 
There are movies about nuclear weapons. You can see that old guy with his hat on the bomb coming down. Yeah. There are there are lectures, there are there's information, there are curriculum, there's uh, there's sermons, there are talks, there's positions. Uh, uh, we have a, a thing for young people, by the way. Every year we give a youth award for young people who are working on the. And we had a lady, a young lady from St. Paul's who made an application last year. Uh, we considered her for uh, uh, the Gorbachev Schultz Award, by the way. But um, uh, if you're interested, maybe a starting place would be to just, just take a look at, at uh the information that's out there, and there, there are a lot of suggestions of what a person can do. You can get involved in the legislative bills, by the way, uh, and, and just talk to people. I mean, there's such a silence about nuclear weapons. And they see, and if you know, you, you, if, you're, if you walk down the street, you, if your friend sees you, they don't even want to talk to you. Here comes that nuclear weapons person. <laughs> I, I want to have a happy life. What are you doing here? Uh, but I think it's incumbent upon uh, everybody to uh, to begin to learn and to begin to um, figure out where you can plug in. You know, can I belong to voices or can I belong to plowshares or I can belong to a nuclear threat initiative or can I can belong to whatever it is. And one more and then we're going to go home. Okay. So, the director so always. one of our priorities at St. Paul's is thinking about children and families and this is obviously a very loaded topic, pun intended. And you in your book reference that you have created some resources specifically for younger children, not just youth. Yep and engaging them in helping them feel safe and helping them know God's love for them is present. Can you say a little more about what those videos and other resources are as we think about appropriate and age-sensitive uh, ways to engage yeah. with our children so that you know we, we create a sense of trust in God and, mm -hmm. and that they know that we care about them, but that yeah. we are willing to talk truthfully about difficult things? Yeah, we do. We, we've only taken... It, it, baby steps. We, we have curriculum, we have um, videos for little children on nuclear weapons. And we have videos for uh, teenagers, and we have junior high, and we have videos for high school. We don't have extensive, I mean, it's just a, a couple of us doing the best we can, uh, taking a shot here and a shot there. Uh, but um, uh, if you if you plug into our uh, uh, website, you can you can see the material. That's good. There are a lot of people who, who put out good materials these days, by the way. But that's it. I'm tired of talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I want to thank you personally for mentioning Bob Woodward. My father taught him history and civics and social studies. Oh, so my I'm always delighted to oh, really? see about oh, wow, 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 wow. uh, You said you had three purposes when you wrote this book. It was a letter to update George on what you were thinking. Yeah, yeah. You wanted to challenge readers, and you wanted to honor and give tribute to George Schultz. I think you accomplished that. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, good. will you pray us out? Okay. <laughs> Almighty God, the beginning and the end are in your hands. And we thank you for the privilege of our time. We pray that you would inspire us that we might be on behalf of our earth, your earth, and that we might use our days 
to make generations possible for those who come after us. And this we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much.